Welcome to Gen Z Hoops, the Gen Z basketball, coaching, and sports business show. On this podcast, you'll learn from professional players, coaches, and executives from all over the world and see the court in a brand new way. And now, joining you courtside, your Gen Z host, John Hartafillis. Coach Waltz, what's going on? Hey, man. Nice to meet you and nice to be here. Super fun having you on the show. Obviously, learned a lot from you in our class um, in, in GSB with, with Nick and, and, and Coach Fox and Bossy and everyone. And obviously, super cool to have you on the show. So thank you so much uh, for coming on. It's going to be a lot of fun. I know there, there's so many things. Nick kind of texted me a little list of all the fun things to ask you about and all the, all the cool experiences you've had in, uh, through, through, through your experiences um, in all these years kind of coaching. So really definitely excited to jump right in. I mean, the first thing, I mean, I, I'm sure people kind of just like I originally just asked you all these questions about your South Bay stuff. And of course, we'll get to that. I'm kind of curious about where it all began, maybe right when you, you, you got out of school, you're a super young coach. What kind of made you think that you were gonna, about to go into this lifetime of coaching? What, what, what kind of was the catalyst for that and, and, and what drove you to really think that's what you wanted to do? If I could go back, I would be a coach, but the way it happened wasn't from any sort of foresight. When I went to college, I don't think I really was doing it for the right reasons. I was kind of just taking my next step in life. But I didn't really have a vision or a solid plan. But I knew that I wanted to coach. I knew that it was something that I thought I'd be good at. I graduated from high school in California and then just wanted to do something different. So I went out to New Mexico and went to college there. And then when I graduated, stayed there and, or stayed here. That's where I'm at now. And I coached all the sports. I coached football in the fall basketball, whatever, either track or baseball. And uh, just that's how you learn. You know, nowadays in the pros, you don't come across a lot of guys that grinded from high school, but typically the best coaches that I know have. I'm glad that I got that foundation. I mean, I coached a million different sports and then basketball was always my main sport, but I love coaching football I loved the smell of it and the two-a-days and then getting it rolling and then coming to basketball. It's never an easy transition, you know, because when you're coaching, you're, you're doing it all. And you know in high school how much you do. It gave me, like I said, it gave me that foundation. So I started in college or uh, in high school. My first job post or above high school was a CBA slash international league job. The league that I went to change to the CBA. So I didn't go from high school to college. I went from high school to pros, then to college, then to the pros for good. So incredible just thinking about that, that, that career path, right? Going from, like you said, high school to the pros and back and, and all that back and forth. And obviously picking up so many experiences along the way. I'm kind of curious when, so when, you, when going to the pros, was that all the internet? Cause obviously there's so many international stops that you had. Is that kind of what that looked like? And, and if so, maybe what uh, drew you to test those international waters, maybe right, at, right once you finished coaching at the high school level? Being overseas, like I love different cultures, different people, different belief systems, the way people live. And typically I'm the type, and it's not, it's not really a good characteristic, but I'm typically the type that once I'm into something, I'm always looking out, like wondering what's out there in the world, wondering what's, what I'm missing, the typical FOMO feeling. But when you start thinking about, hey, I might have a chance to go overseas, to me, that sounds super interesting to go overseas and coach. And uh, not only that, the experience that I had, there was a guy that was working, trying to find me jobs, and he was like, I can get you a bunch of head coaching jobs in some smaller countries. This is what kind of when I first started. So there was a, you know, quite a bit of countries that I ended up going to. One of them being Saudi Arabia was a one that most, a lot of people wouldn't choose. But for me, it was like my first choice because it was super exotic, super different. Hopefully we'll talk a little bit about that. But for me, it was like a FOMO thing. Like I'm here and I'm working, but I still wanted to like see the world. And I'm thinking if I just, put my head down when I'm young and don't ever get these experiences. I may never get a chance to do them again. So that's why I started to go overseas when I was a young coach. 
we're definitely going to talk about that stuff. And I, I can only imagine maybe maybe how, how crazy a lot of these stories are in terms of maybe your experiences there at the, at the beginning and getting acclimated. I mean, definitely something that I, I have this little bit of a fun which from hearing from you. Obviously, I've, I've been to Greece. I've coached in Greece maybe for a quick trip, but nothing maybe as as uh, immersive as going all in into a different culture for, for months on end in a season, which is so cool. I'm curious maybe, so you mentioned Saudi Arabia and how most people maybe wouldn't pick that as their first destination. I'm curious maybe what of uh, the, the initial, well, once you got there, maybe crossing the border into, into Saudi Arabia, uh, doing all those things, what did, what did that really look like? like in, in, in that first culture shock? Well, it was pretty bizarre. Like, well, so people really don't understand like what they're going to run into when they get there. So when I started talking to that team, the, the leader of the team was a guy that these guys don't really open up as to who they are, what they do, but this was a prominent member of the community in Jeddah. I was in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, which is on the, far west coast on the Red Sea, right across from Africa and Itaria would be the country that's directly across the Red Sea from. And this this was a guy that just was amazing to me on the phone. And he just really wanted me to come there. And, you know, to be wanted is a great feeling. And this guy just called me every day. He was great on the phone. He was a talker. He loved, you know, we talked basketball forever. And, you know, he got me to go over there. So, I make the decision. I tell him, okay, sounds fun. Let's do it. But as soon as I decided to go, it was scary. Like, I didn't know if I should have done it. You know I mean? Like, you're like, holy, holy crap. I'm going to Saudi Arabia now. When I was heading over there, it was uh, Ramadan. It was, which is a Muslim, I don't know if it's called a holiday, but it's a period of time where they fast during the day and they eat during at night. So typically, I, all I knew of it was that. That's all I knew of it. It was a, you know, but I didn't know that it affected everything, the culture, everything you do. It affects sports. It affects everything. So typically, you're flying overseas to get there. It's a long flight, like a 20-hour flight from JFK, and landed at 11 o'clock at night. So I'm tired and, you know, r- like ready to go to the hotel and sleep. These guys just drive me straight to the gym and they weren't even people with the team. They just were people that they sent to the airport. So I'm not, they're not, they can't speak English. So I can't even communicate with them. So on our trip, they're not even telling me where we're going. We get to the front of the, what is to be the sports complex. They get out, take my bags out, put it on the sidewalk, hand me a piece of paper that's written in, in Arabic. And they're like, point to the door. So I walk up, and this is like midnight now from getting your bags, getting up. I walk up with my bags, dragging them up to the door, and I find my friend that I knew from being, you know, from recruiting me to go there. And he's like, hey, coach, what's going on? And he's just like, it's time for practice. You know, it was midnight, and I was tired, and I was in like travel club. Like I wasn't gym shoes on, anything like that. And he's like, come on down and meet the team. So he sends me down to the gym and he stays upstairs. And if you in these countries overseas, in these huge sports complex, there's all these different pro teams. So there was a volleyball team with a French coach. They were practicing. It was there was a swimming team practicing in the swimming pool. There was a team handball team practicing. And there was like 500 people playing like you know, in New York City Park playing on the uh, playing basketball with slippers on. And some of them had tennis shoes, some didn't. And he's like, your team's out there. If you can imagine going out to the court, not speaking the language, trying to find who my team is, get all these people off the court, find out where the basketballs are, find out what's going on and then have a practice was like a, the most bizarre, scary thing I ever been, was involved in because that's kind of, that's exactly what it was. This man, he assumed that I was just going to jump in and take control, and I guess that's a good thing because ultimately later on he gave me well from the that day on he gave me as much control as I wanted. But at that point, I would have liked a little bit more kind of structure for what we're walking into. But yeah, that was really one of my first jobs overseas and. If you can imagine that situation, it just really was freaked me out. But once we got made it through that night, it ended up being an amazing experience. I found the guys that spoke English that could help me communicate. They then started sending me their translators and things ended up working out great. But that one night was a crazy experience that I'll never forget because 
I remember thinking to myself, is this really real? Because I didn't know what, if I could get through that night. I was ready to just get, find a cab and get back to the airport. But again, in Saudi Arabia, you can't just go to the airport and leave. So you're stuck. You're there and you're like, you better get this done. And that actually gave me a ton of confidence. And it also gave me a ton, a, a lot of like belief in like people. You feel this anger or this fear, but everybody's the same. And like all these people kind of came together to help get that thing done. And it was a great experience. I mean, that, that is just so cool. I mean, I kind of think about how crazy it is going over to Greece and we have to you know, figure stuff out and it's and it's super controlled or my freshman team, right? They're all 14 and, and they're right and going crazy. And I think that's crazy. But what you what you just described is actual pandemonium. I've had a lot of coaches come on and talk about how their first time in the league, they had to write a big scouting report or get thrown into the fire with a lot of things <laughs> to do. This is definitely a little bit different, which I think is super cool. And it's that, the idea of, of, what, of what it's like overseas. I mean, thank you for sharing that. It's, it's such a cool Right, well, you know, story. Also over there, I mean, th those, they're such nice people. I mean, you know, we've been kind of tainted by what we believe. I mean, what I've found from being in other countries is the people of all these countries, Russia, Saudi Arabia, the people that live, the citizens are just people that have kids that want a great life, that want to be happy, that want to have a good dinner. They're not thinking about political issues or things like that. And when you get down on the ground there, then you realize that right away. You know, you realize that they try to bring you into their culture, but it's done in such a really like loving way. There's no, what's your religion? You know, do you, are you Muslim? I mean, they don't do that. They just try to teach you what they're about and they do it in a really open and like easy way. There, there's no pressure, but you no, know, in Saudi Arabia, nothing stops religion is the main thing and even if you play a game that goes through period of prayer you stop that game in the middle of the game and if you're muslim you uh, you pray and if your coach is from another country you go off the court and do another room when they're done praying it could be the second quarter with five minutes left the buzzer goes off you pray go back on start playing again it's super wild that's incredible. I never really thought about that. And, and that's yeah. it's so cool yeah. that, that, that that's how it works. Yeah. Um, but I'm thinking, I mean, there's definitely so many other things that I imagine that, that happened when you were inside of Arabia that must have been really cool. I mean, the one thing I have to ask about, um, because because Nick, Nick did tell me to, to bring it up, I think it's it must be a crazy story. I'm, I'm, I'm really curious to see what this is about. Is the house burning down in Saudi Arabia? I'm not sure maybe when this happened or where or how, but oh, can, you yeah. tell, can you elaborate on that story a little bit? It sounds, it sounds like even crazier than that first practice. Right. So the infrastructure in these countries is different than ours. Well, you've been to Athens, right? I mean, um, you know, you see the like people's like massive electrical wires all over yep. and people stealing cable from everywhere, whatever, you know, you see. So the infrastructure in these places is a little trippy, especially like when you're wondering, the, you know, the electricity. Where I lived was a, a compound that was kind of, so it was right in the middle of the city. Theoretically, inside that compound, you didn't really have to follow the religious rules of the city, even though you do just out of respect as much as you can. But inside my compound, let's say, for instance, during Ramadan, I could get up and eat lunch in the day and do whatever I wanted to. There, That wouldn't be against the law. But these compounds are basically just small little like a little uh, apartment complex but as i said the infrastructure was crazy and i always used to think to myself wow you know this place doesn't look stable you know with the with the wires everywhere anyway it was um after a practice which i got back at and this was the first month i was there and i got home about 1 30 in the morning which i told you practice was like midnight and I never slept well there, so it, like the first month. It's really bizarre. And so I would just basically get back, do my like practice for the next day, talk to the assistants, then they would leave and go home. Uh, and my assistants were Saudis, but they spoke English. They would, we would meet and then they would go home. So I would basically sit up all night and watch movies until I could try to get a couple hours sleep. In this compound is a bunch of engineers from Europe. These were Irish engineers and people from Lebanon, all, all over the world. And there's no plumbing in Saudi Arabia. There's water trucks everywhere. So 
there's people over there from all over the world trying to develop a, a system that works for them for the water. They have a really tough time. So there's all these engineers. We all live in this, this area. Anyway, so I'm sitting there and I hear a pop, a really loud pop. And I hear it like sounds like a loud shotgun, but I, I, I didn't feel like it was gunfire. I, I looked out my window about 20 minutes after the pop and I see a flame next door and I go out my door and as I turn the corner, this place, and it's like 3 a.m. now, 3.30, is going in flames like on fire. And I'm the only person up in this whole complex. Like there's, it's a huge complex, maybe 50 apartments. And as far as I see, I'm the only person awake. So I'm banging on windows of people that I don't know. And they're just, you know, they're Europeans in Saudi. I'm an American. They're a little bit uh, skittish too, you know? So one of the friends of mine was an Irish engineer and I pounding on his door and he looks out and he tells me what's up. And I'm like, there's a fire. There's people are going to die. And uh, he finally woke up, but nobody would wake up. So I go into his house and I call the front desk and I'm like, emergency fire. This person's supposed to speak English. And they just kept hanging up on me. By the time I ran to the front, finally got as many people out as we could. The people's house that were on fire got out, but they were really badly like smoke inhalated. Nobody died, by the way, but it was the craziest thing. I ran because it was this was like five feet from my house. I ran back into my house, got like the things I needed, my computer and a couple clothes because I thought everything was going to burn down. They eventually got it out, but they never fixed it. Like the whole place was like charred. I lived in this charred place for the rest of the time. That's incredible. I cannot believe <laughs> that it is. The, the details, I mean, were so vivid. And I, 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 I kind of saw you running through the hallways, banging on doors. Like I kind of picture it. Which right. Is so and, cool. you, and, and they have like, I don't know if it's, you know, they have army, Saudi army people that watch the gates of that, that sit on giant, you know, M60s and these guys are sleeping on the, and I'm trying to tell them and they don't want me to talk to them. We're not supposed to talk to them. So during the fire, I'm screaming at them like it's a fire. Finally, I got someone to look and then they freaked out and like everybody freaked out. But yeah, the people from the other side of the wall, literally, you know, I'm pounding on their door and the lady who freaked out at me for pounding on her door. Once she finally realized that she was really happy that I got her out, but she screamed at me for like 10 minutes before she realized what I was trying to tell her. Like she was really mad at me for break Bart. I barged in her front door. If you can imagine, like scared the shit out of her. <laughs> Just, I mean, the, the, obviously we also think about the language barrier in terms of how it would relate to maybe calling time out overseas or something like that. That's always been like kind of an issue we've had when we go to Greece and that's like, Oh, how are we going to navigate that? That's a much more serious problem where you need to kind of, where the, where the language barrier becomes a little bit more problematic. So right. Honestly, there was a little life and death situation yep. going on. Yep. Yep. It was well, of course, crazy. Thank, thank God everyone was okay. But it, it's, it's, it's crazy just thinking about, about an experience like that. I'm curious, maybe. So you obviously didn't stop there with your overseas trip. You went to so many other countries, right? China, Venezuela, all these other different places. Obviously, once leave, after leaving Saudi Arabia, what kind of kept that? that, that obviously, you'd already really um, just enjoyed different cultures. Um, you had a couple of crazy experiences in Saudi Arabia. What kind of made you want to keep on uh, trying different things? Well, those things never like that type of thing. Again, like the adventure, getting more adventurous just makes you want to do more. I've had about eight head coaching jobs and a bunch of assistant coaching jobs. I know to do a head coaching job right, you really have to go at it hard. I mean, being a head coach is a much different job being an assistant. Being an assistant, you can have a great relationship with the players. And being a head coach, if you want to establish accountability, you have to set your rules and you have to establish it. So when you go overseas, these teams expect the minute you land in their country – that their team's going to be better. They don't realize that you have to build something. So going overseas initially, typically you go because the team over there is doing poorly. They won't, you know, they typically have country coaches from in their own country, but if their season's going bad and they're desperate, then they try to get someone from here. And that's like where I would fit in and typically go over there and try to fix these teams. That's I got to be good at that. It was like something that I would typically go to teams in the middle of the uh, season um, and do that. 
but I guess the reason I say that is later on, I started like looking for assistant jobs and a friend of mine was going to China. And at that time I was in Belarus as an assistant, which is a former Soviet country with great players. That it's like a silent, like once I got into Belarus, that's a whole nother long story, but I found a ton of players up there. We'll talk about that one other day. But anyway, I had just gotten up there and my friend said, come down and be my assistant in China. And knowing that the CBA in China is known as a great league. It's a, it's an amazing league. Uh, the teams are financed very well. The players are played, paid very well. And the league is very good. It's done really well. I think that, you know, I think their capabilities to be so much better than they are uh, again, but that's, another story but i like going overseas as an assistant much more because uh you, i can enjoy it much better when i did meet my friend in china we met and i landed i, I had to go through hong kong and wait a day or so to get my visa then when i finally got to the i got to the hotel it was like 11 a.m and my friend was there and i knock on his door and he says hey what's up man and i was gonna be his assistant he goes hey man we have a game at one <laughs> and he'd only been there like two days. They were playing this summer league game outside with their pro team with no imports against just a bunch of old pros and a bunch of guys on these outside courts to show you what how these overseas teams react to American coaches. This guy had been there like a day. He had one practice with him. His name's Casey Owens. He's a good friend of mine, and he was a coach at South Bay as well. But we went out to play in this tournament and we lost a game. These were really good players, but they weren't teams in the, like, so if you can imagine the Milwaukee Bucks young players playing in a tournament and losing a game, you know, the coaches, you know, meaning like just playing in a random tournament in Milwaukee somewhere and losing a game. It was a huge deal. We almost got fired after like 24 hours being there because we lost a game with really a, bu a bunch of players that we had not never coached before. Cause these guys think, well, why didn't you coach them to win? Well, we really didn't even know our team and it was kind of like a pickup game, but anyway, go ahead, ask your question. Sorry if I get off on a tangent like that. No, you're good. I mean, we can cut it right. I was curious. You, you mentioned something about, about Belarus. Is that another good, you said, is that another good story? Well, I just, the, the Russian and former Soviet countries that I've been to are just loaded with huge ta talented players. It's like not a place super recruited for, by colleges. And I've always thought, man, like, because Belarus is known as a smaller country with smaller sports. And I didn't get to stay there very long. I did, I, you know, w once I got with the team, I, I ended up going to China pretty quickly. But man, I couldn't believe the number of big, talented, like three and four men with skill that could shoot that don't play anywhere. I was asking guys like, are you on the top team? Is like, no, I'll never be on the top team. And this is like a six foot 10 strong athlete who could run, catch and shoot the three from the NBA range and like really knew the game. And I was like, I could, this guy could play in the G league right now or whatever it was, the D league at the time. Like there was so many players and that's the thing. Like there's so many players around the world that are good at our, at, at our game. And there's only five spots on the court. There's only a few leagues to play in. I mean, if we look around the world, there's so much talent everywhere. It's unbelievable. I mean, really crazy to think about all that. I'm curious why you brought up how uh, that kind of transition, of, and it's a huge decision of guys going to the G League um, or going overseas. I'm curious for, for you, you, you had all this experience overseas now, all these countries like China, Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, right? With the, the list kind of goes on. Uh, what made you uh, look at the gravity towards the G League and, and come back to the States to coach here? I mean, that's always been the thing. Like you said, I mean, I could go do my Indiana Jones thing and that was fun. And but ultimately, you got to make a career and they're not going to keep you like the, those overseas jobs. As much fun as they sound like they're temporary things, you either go over there and win a championship or you're going to not be back the next year. So there's not a lot of realism from the, the them. They're trying to get you to salvage a season when you're there. And if you can do that, then you'll have a great relationship and be able to go back if you want. But coming back was more career 
career move, like get in the G League and try to show what I can do. I mean, I always feel like I really love the G League because there's so few people. There's there's just not a lot of people that are familiar with it. So if you come up like I do through the the CBA, which is an, it was like the first G League, the, basically a full free agency with a ton of great talent that the NBA used to draw from before there was a G League. Those of us that came up through there and that are still in this G League have kind of a unique skill set because it's not like the NBA. It's not like college or high school. It's a completely different mindset from the players and the coaches. And so as I sit here today, I feel like I have a unique, even though the G League isn't where people want to end their career, to me, I could coach in the G League forever. Like to me, that's a great career because it's so unique. It's something that not a lot of people understand or know how to coach in. I mean, 100%. Can, can you talk a little about that to the CBA? Because it's something I've, I've heard of before, but obviously being a member of Gen Z, 20 years old now, it's something kind of we've all, as basketball fans, kind of forgotten about it. All of us new fans, we never well, really you, learned Well, you about have it. to research it when we get off because you'd be surprised at the length. The CBA was the oldest league in, in the country wow. for a long time. Do yourself a favor and look back at the rosters of some of these teams. They're all NBA players. and So when you think about the G League now, it's for development for younger players. There's massive talent with huge upside. The CBA was filled with NBA vets with, with experience. I mean, the final season that I coached uh, in the CBA, I had Dickie Simpkins on my team, a guy that had NBA championships with the Bulls, players that all had NBA experience. And, you know, and these were teams that if you equate them from those teams to the G League teams now – they would be better able to win a pro game than the young kids now. But it's a whole different story. Back then, it was like, what would the term be? Like, all for one. Like, so if you liked a player from another team, when the season ends, you could just go, if you could get him, if you could do a better job, give him more money, give it, give him a better city, you could steal players from anyone. So it was super competitive, and it was really, really a fun league because the competition was through the roof. That's, that's incredible. And for our listeners, it's, it's, we're talking about the Continental Basketball Association, not the, not the Chinese Basketball Association right, today. Right, right. That's what we, look, that's what we kind of think look of. that up when you get a chance. You'll be surprised at, one, the longevity of the league. I mean, Kobe Carl, who I work for now, his dad started in the CBA. Phil Jackson started in the CBA. I mean, these are the, this was, was not like, you know, rec league. This was amazing players. And, and you just, when you put together a roster, you just had, so they, to, to give you an example, they made a rule that you had to have one rookie and that made coaches crazy because it was like, oh my God, one rookie. I mean, I can have an NBA, like I can have 10 NBA players. I don't, I want my 11th guy to be another NBA guy, but you know, they make you, you know, having a rookie was like, Oh my God, they're going to take a spot away from us because I mean, the, the talent that you could get at that time was unbelievable. Like those guys, did. They these are guys that were still able to play in the NBA. So they weren't going to go overseas. They were just going to stay right here. So you could just get talent through the roof. That's so interesting. And obviously thinking about the CBA, I remember in the Jordan documentary, Phil Jackson spoke about um, how they would put uh, the, like they would kill chickens and put the blood on top of the, on top of the seats uh, before games with the opposing fans. That's not, I mean, not that specifically, but are there any other kind of crazy stories that you have from, from your time there? The fans really get to know the coaches in these because in your conference of five, six teams, you play these teams and these fans of these these cities are really loyal. So the people that sit in and around the bench on the, on the other uh, opposing teams, they get to know you as it's like a love hate relationship. Some nights you'll just be fighting with these fans back and forth and they know you're like, Brian, shut the F up. You know what? You know, sit down, you little midget, you know, stuff like that. Ultimately, we end up like with a like a good relationship. But during the games, the fans are on you super hard. I mean, not like in Me in Mexico, they would carry shields or behind me when I'm a coach because they would throw beers at you. But in the CBA, they would just hound you to death. So if there was a thousand fans in the seats, they were sitting right behind the visiting bench. And they're just it's like their job was just to get you crazy. And in, in fact, in some CBA cities, the bench would be these 10 seats 
And then the 11th seat were fans. Uh, you know, I mean, it was, and then the baseline seats were fans. So they would just put fans all around you. And it was like, it was war zone going into these smaller towns. And the, it made for great competitive games. And players love that. Players love playing with that. Oh my, I mean, that's just incredible. And I, I, I love that story. I mean, it's funny. Like I, my, my first year coaching, which I'm, it wasn't too long ago. It was three years ago when I was 18. I mean, I got called pretty boy a bunch of times and people were, and people were howling at me one of the triple headers because I was so young and I thought that was a big deal. Uh, but that's obviously uh, doesn't even compare uh, to what you were going through, of course. Um, in, in right. That, no, in that you got to, you got to have, uh, you can't have rabbit ears as a coach, you know, because me, yeah, you don't know me. I'm five foot three. I'm stretching. I say I'm five, four. But so, you know, I catch all kind of shit like that all the time. So even though you're a good looking dude, you got to you got to get those rabbit. You can't really listen to the specifics as best you can. I know it's really hard, but that's my one advice for you as a young coach. Don't get rabbit ears because your players know you'll hear a veteran, a veteran player. Like if you start moving up, veteran players will know those coach don't get rabbit ears. You know, you can't. You, Players are really good at blocking out fans better than like coaches because you want to fight back. Maybe if you're a fiery guy in a New Yorkers. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, no, you can't you can't let it bother you, especially if you're ever going to go overseas because they'll get you. Oh, definitely. I mean, I mean, that's that's obviously great advice for assistant coaches everywhere. But you've had, well, especially in our GSB class, so much good advice. It, it was, I mean, I was taking notes furiously because obviously it's 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 what I'm doing being an assistant coach, and it's something where I just think that you would you had gone on in, into detail about about the difference between assistant coach and a head coach and why and 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 kind of just the, the role. It's not so much on like a whole different level. It's just a different kind of job. Like, can you talk right, a little bit about that in terms? Of, and, and can, you, can you talk a little bit about that and, and the difference between the two as opposed to just seeing it as a progression? It's more so just two completely different things. Right. I mean, your, your head, if you're an assistant, you got to understand really what your head coach is going through, especially to start the season. He's trying to establish parameters and like uh, barriers and rules for his team. Some coaches have a lot, some have a little, but they're, they're still going through it, but they want to run their system. You you want to help them. You want to make their life better. You don't want to make it worse. It's, it's, it's really easy for an assistant to make a, a head coach's life difficult one by like, you know, you, you finally get the job and you finally get the coach and you get on the bench and you feel like you want to start working officials. I think, you know, one thing, never work officials as an assistant. I mean, I have that problem myself, but I know, you know, ultimately you want to let the head coach do it because he has his system. He wants to work it and you can mess that up for him. And, you know, you just want to be the guy that's not over coaching. You know, nowadays assistants are like, take him out, coach, get him out. He's making a mistake. Or like, especially in high school or even in younger or for coaching younger kids in college, they need some room. The coach is going to decide that room. This, when a, a head coach has assistants constantly talking about subbing, he may be a friend of yours, your head coach. He may want to listen to you, but ultimately, unless he says to you, hey, what should we do with subbing? I My advice is I let them do it until they come to me with, to ask for help because they're trying to develop their system, their sub patterns, this and that. And they may have something in their mind. You may change it because they want to listen to you but then he may not get a feeling of what he wanted to fix or get to see because he changed it because what you said, it may be a good thing, it may be good advice. Until they come to you, keep all your stuff inside, have all your suggestions ready and noted so you don't forget them, but don't just blurb them out. I mean, that really is a young assistant coach's probably biggest issue that they're just over coaching. You need to learn from the head coach, learn from the environment and don't, you know, distance from the players. Like you want to be that person that makes things go better, not worse for your head coach. Hundred percent, and obviously every, every kind of situation is different, right? In terms, and like you said, if your coach is a friend of yours, maybe he's not. And then there's so many different ways in the where this is true. And you spoke about a little bit in the class about maybe you maybe the coach is a little bit more aggressive, maybe he isn't. Maybe it's someone um, with a, with an idea of, of culture that doesn't align exactly. What's kind of your advice and kind of on identifying maybe the, the differences and maybe how to handle those if whenever they're there. Right. So coaches, I mean, culture is becoming a big thing. Coaches are doing a lot of different kind of alternative styles as far as rules and things that maybe because a lot of guys don't want to be yellers, screamers. They don't want they don't want to have to, you know, do the discipline. Ultimately, 
in order to be good, your team has to do some simple things. They have to run back on defense, not yell at the ref. They have to do things that are just basic, sustainable things on the court. And however that gets done, if it gets done, it gets done. There's no real way to do it. The thing is, developing your own system is like when you want to be a head coach, how can you develop these parameters? What I've found is it's difficult to be a nice head coach from day one, because ultimately, as long as you're winning games, things work great. But when things go bad, people typically go for themselves. And if there's no parameters set, a nice head coach is going to get hit. They're not going to, you're not going to get the payback. Like, well, you were happy when things were going good. Now you're not happy. He's basically, they're going to come at, back at you. You have to develop those things with the thoughts. You know, you want to think about, let's say you start out 10 and 0. You should be thinking about and not thinking about ever losing a game, but thinking about what's going to happen if we hit adversity and, and and get that ready. Like if we hit adversity, if you miss out one of the get years in the G League, we started out 10 and one. We were shooting like 56% from three. We actually had a meeting about if we're not, sh we stopped shooting the ball well. The rules of the road say we're going to not shoot it well at some point in the future. And we talked about that. And then, you know, we also talked about, are we jinxing ourselves by even talking about it? But I thought it was a smart thing to do because we kind of anticipated adversity. The adversity obviously came because, you know, in basketball, the shots don't, they don't always go in and you have to be ready to deal with them when they don't. And a coach with parameters that, that are clearly set are much more able to handle those bad times when they come. The nicest guy that nobody that everybody's kind of doing their own thing and then when the bad thing hits it's much harder to deal with um, and, and it, it's interesting because there's there's so much of that decision on on too much positivity too much negativity of course there's a, there's a fine line but whether it's the assistant coach's job to be over you know opti more optimistic and the coach's job to kind of maybe bring the hammer down and and that's of course different in every staff i'm curious maybe you you've, you've spoken before about maybe the difference between maybe energy and noise and how you could just be on on, on the bench as an assistant just kind of chattering and, and kind of just saying things like oh wow number number five is killing us well obviously he's killing us everyone everyone in the gym kind of knows that how do you kind of make that more productive in, in what you say or, or, may, or maybe not or maybe not saying saying as much right no so you always want to do that so if, if if the guy's killing you instead you know take some time and think about what coverage you want to change to make him you know to deal with that rather than just hit the head coach with some some obvious low-hanging fruit i mean believe me a head coach might be a nice guy and not say anything to you because of that but if you just say that he's thinking shit i want head coaches want solutions they don't want what they already know as if you have two assistant coaches three assistant coaches and one guy's given a bunch of advice the other two if you're they're inexperienced they're probably thinking oh shit man this guy's coaching his ass off i need to get in there and throw my basically don't worry about what anyone else is doing just think of ways well we need to trap him because pick and roll he's turning the corner every time i would trap him coach if we get the ball out of his hand that's something productive if a guy's just super hot, we're just, let's just play like full denial on him. Put a guy with no help responsibilities. But just think of the ways you can stop a guy and have that ready. And even if your coach is rolling, you might even say to him, coach, I have some ideas for number five if you want them. Or, and then he might hit you up at halftime. He might say, let me hear him. You know, and you don't know. I mean, depending on how your coach runs practice, if you have three or four defenses in, you might suggest a change to one of those or some simple adjustment that you could make that you guys may never have done like an a, an older assistant maybe that's coached 30 years isn't going to do anything during the game they haven't practiced but some of the younger guys would try it there's no right or wrong in that but like if you have an old legendary head coach and you try to give them some advice that's out there that's not going to go over well either but you should know that by that time Definitely. I mean, and, and there's so much kind of thinking about that. And it's, it's an issue I have it all the time, right? Being a young coach, it's like, I want to prove myself. I want to show that I, that I know what I'm talking about, that I, and just jump right into it. Or I'm um, just say something just to, to, to have something to say, but it is very important maybe to, to, to really think it through instead of just saying something out, out of nowhere. And, and of course, I mean, we've been talking a lot about this um, coach to coach relationship, right? With assistants to head coaches, but obviously there's a whole roster that you have to tend to too. And as an assistant, that's a huge part of the game. I'm curious, maybe like when a player comes out of the game and they're, and they're frustrated, or, or maybe it's just maybe in practice or whatever it might be in, in those conversations with them. How 
do you make sure that that conversation is a productive one that you're really connecting with them as opposed to just maybe pushing them further away? Right. So, you know, if a player comes out frustrated and it's a really, that's not a good situation. There's not a lot of great solutions. You've either done it or you haven't at that moment, meaning you've connected with that player in the months before that moment happens. You're not going to go down there and give them the Newt Rockney speech. So you're basically, if a guy is frustrated, I'll feel it out. If I'm going down there, I might just sit down for a minute. He knows I'm coming and I might not say anything. Just sit down for a second, let him cool off, you know, hit him on the, you know, give him a hit. Just say, are we cool? Are you good? Are we, you know, do we need to talk about something? You know, something really, really vague. If it's a coverage issue, if it's something he doesn't understand or doing wrong, then that's a simple fix. But with a frustrated guy, if you've connected with him already, then your presence there is supportive. If you're the type that's a huffer, puffer, and you run down there, you're risking a lot at that moment. You you don't want to come at people that are frustrated. If you have built the respect by then, you sit down and then you deal with the issues. If it's a coverage issue, you fix it. If it's a frustration issue, if he starts you know, saying, why the hell is he taking me out? You have to be sure to not validate that. But, you know, you need to, you know, basically get across to him. Do you want to go back or do you not? You know, if you don't, let me know and I'll let you and and we'll make that right. Or do you want to just cool off here? Do you want to get back in? You know, you'll get guys, if you go too quick, they might be like in the pros, if you go too quick, you might lose them for a few minutes. To make it simple, you have to connect with people way before those moments happen. You can't just like have this distant relationship and then when a person's frustrated, go down and change the world. Uh, It's not going to happen. You have to get close, understand all the different personalities of your team and know who you're dealing with. Typically, there's to be two to three or three guys of a team that would ever get frustrated. Most of the guys are trying to earn favor with the coach. There's only the superstars or guys that would typically even show your head coach frustration. So you should know that before even the season starts, who I need to connect with, who I might have to deal with in stressful moments during the game, and then get that. You know, I've sat down with players before the season that I've known have those issues. And say, you know, if you have issues during the game, I'm going to come down there. I may not say anything. You let me know what what I need to know, and then we'll talk about it. Again, vague but supportive. I mean, that's, that's great advice to something. I mean, I especially listen to and thinking about how do I do I do I go over there and, and really make that conversation something constructive because it's easy, like you said, when, when you're winning to, to laugh and joke and, and and that's a lot of fun. And when you're losing games, obviously not so much. And, and I'm curious too, I mean, thinking about, obviously everyone kind of knows, uh, or it's kind of obvious that you don't want to go down huffing and puffing because, you know, no, no one wants to be yelled at. And it's kind of something that everyone understands. But also there's, there's also, like, like we said, the fine line the other way around where if you're too nice, maybe then there's a, that was more of an issue where the barrier is kind of broken and maybe the head coach is now upset because the players a grad, like the, the players kind of see you maybe as a joke and then concurrently that's the whole pro or that's the team or something to right. that effect. I'm curious as maybe what the other side is of that in terms of making sure you don't go too much in, um, into being maybe too nice um, and keeping that barrier there. If you're an assistant and a player just goes off about your head coach to you down the end of the bench, if you two are the only ones there, now you have a lot of things you have to decide. One, do you want to have a relationship with this player? How you can evolve this? So some of these guys are going to just say things that are hyperbolic. They may regret it moments after they say it. But if a player goes off on the head coach to me, one, I'm not going to agree with him. I'm going to try to keep things more basically about what's on the court and the the outcome. But also, I'm going to keep that to me. I don't want the player to know that I'm going to go back and either at that moment or after the game, say he was calling you a pussy or whatever. The the player will know, my players now know that those things mean much less in a, in the emotion uh, in the, in that moment, heat of the battle. Sometimes these guys will really go off. If they think that you're not, that you're the type that's just like going to go tell everything that they, they heard, then you're not going to ever get deeper. They're never going to give you anything more than just surface relationship. If they know that, hey, he knows that I I was just frustrated. He didn't go get me 
kicked off the team or get me suspended. If it's something that's beyond belief, then there's a problem. There's also always different level problems. You know, if a guy's going off, that's a whole different thing. But if he tells you something that the head coach would really be pissed off about, it's not going to help you or the team to just go get it going. At least the first time, I would keep it to myself. And then he's going to know you kept it to yourself. And then the next day at practice, then I would have the talk with him. Like, hey, I didn't talk to him about that. It's not something I want to hear during a game, some bullshit about this guy who really values you. And the reason that you're on the court is because you mean a lot to him. But I'm not going to go in there and tell him what you said. If you happen to keep going there, I have no choice. And I will. But from the standpoint of I think that you were just frustrated and I didn't think it was going to help anything. This is this one we need to talk about. But right now, you know, you, you take steps in life. The next one is going to go to the next step. That one stayed with me. Those things will gain you some respect, make you feel like them feel like you have some experience with frustration or these type of situations. You're not a guy that they can just light up, but you are a guy that will keep some things to themselves. You're not a tattletale. If you see them out after curfew for five minutes, you you run to the head coach. I mean, but you're also not covering it up for them. There's also, there's a fine line. If guys are pushing the limit that could hurt the team, you're going to go to them and you're going to do what's right. But you have to be a person that can understand the gray areas of both of these things. Oh my God, definitely. And it, it's so important to, to, to make sure that you're, that you're keeping on that fine line. And I feel we've said that word a lot because there is a lot of decision making that goes into this. It's not, there's no cookie cutter ranch that works every time, but definitely something that we have to be careful of. And we've spoken so much about these relationships maybe, but there is a lot of maybe the coaching that's to come into this too, maybe in practice. Um, so right, like, whether it's with the scout team um, or whatever, right, when we're doing some practice, what what's kind of your your tips to maybe always be prepared as an assistant so when the head coach turns to you, you're prepared um, in, in almost any situation. Right. So knowing how your coach does practice is the first thing you your practice when he if he does your practice schedules, typically high school, like, you know, you're working all day and you get to the gym and then like your coach has done the practice schedule. It's not like you have meetings like in the pros, you know, so you need to learn your coach and how he runs practice before the season starts. But then once you get to practice, you need to do your best, at least a couple practices in to know every drill you that he does, like you could run it yourself. It shouldn't be five practices in where you're doing the drill for the fifth time and you don't know it. You, you That'd be negligent to me. Like you should learn all these drills as soon as you see them. If he pulls out a new drill and you don't know it, after that practice, you should learn it. You should make sure you know it. Every time you see a coach br- break out, your head coach break out a new drill, you should learn that thing so you can coach it yourself. Scout team needs to be done before. So like you get your scout team stuff ready, you somehow get to that gym. If it, Even if you have a few minutes before practice, get the scout team together and run them through it before you bring them out there. That would look so much better to your head coach. So you're just like, all right, guys, let's go. And they know they're calling the play out. It's not, it's, sometimes you can't do that. But if you want to, you can get all that done. You can get it done. Everything's done way beforehand i mean the positive and negative coaching if your head coach is okay with you stopping practice then do it but don't do it too much if your head coach is a guy that's going to take care of the details you don't need to stop practice because you know he's going to do it let him do it and then he may tell you when he wants you to stop practice so you do it when he tells you but you don't want to be you know the overbearing assistant some assistants stop practice way too much the head coach will do that if he thinks it needs to be done Again, once you shed trying to prove something as an assistant, you'll become a better assistant. You don't need to show how great you are because being an assistant is such a hard job. It's 24-7. You're on stage all the time. You're constantly showing who you are. You don't have to try to show who you are more because you still have to run your scout team. You still have to do your JV, do the, the freshman team, whatever it is. You're always a bunch of stuff like you're going to be evaluated 12 times a day anyway. So do those things that your main job description, do them like so detailed that nobody could ever question anything you do. Never walk on the court like, I don't know what we're going to do today. We're going to figure that out. That's just send the send your team home or let them get shots because you're going to have a shitty practice. You plan your practice. And if your practice plan changes, fine. Like, oh, I want to do this drill. 
that's fine. Like, I'd rather do a shooting game here. Like, we're, we're our practices, we practice great for 45 minutes, but then we went downhill. I don't want to lose that great 45 minutes. I'm going to do a shooting drill, do some scrimmage, and we'll get out. You know, changing a practice schedule is fine, but not having one is negligent coaching. Like, you're, that's not coaching. You have to prepare yourself. And you have to know exactly what you're doing. Your team has to know why you're doing it. Because players know when you're bullshitting practice. They can feel it. Like, especially at, like, varsity level, high school, pretty much they probably can. But once you get to college or after that, then if you're not prepared, they're like, this dude's faking it immediately. Definitely. I mean, it's so important to make sure you're on your game because obviously players are, are smart. They will pick it up immediately and, and you want to make sure that that's, that's never impression because then you lose guys. Matt, you could do so many things right and then that one thing is wrong um, or it looks like you're not prepared and then, then the kind of relationship kind of is a little soiled. But I'm curious, maybe right, we've, we've spoken a lot about maybe like that. That's a lot of the on, on the court stuff, but with, with so many practices during a season, right, there's all this stuff. It's it's maybe difficult to keep players motivated. Um, and maybe if I, you had said this before, how young guys, while you're trying to build that motivation up, the older guys, you assume that they already have it. So you're kind of just testing it. Can you kind of give us examples of, of how to do either as an assistant um, to make sure that, that the team's motivated from day one to the final buzzer? The ideal situation is early in the season, you're learning your system and you're competing a little bit in practice. Later in the season, you're competing a ton more to the point where hopefully when you get to playoffs and you're starting to get flow, your practices are shorter with a ton of competition. You're playing as much as you can. They know the system. You're, you're, you're getting the details and then your game plans for the other team are something that they've evolved to where they can get from you and really put them on the court really well, like really efficiently. You know, I believe that like when you're going into games against great, like as you're going through playoffs and you're playing teams and nowadays, like we watch in the NBA and these guys will get 35 every night. You'll see James Harden come over, pick and roll, read, pick and roll and just dominate, you know, like get thousand points a night. Like it's easy. And in my opinion, like as you're coaching younger guys all the way up to the NBA, like to me, this is my philosophy. It could be wrong, but like if you let James Harden come over, pick and roll and read, you're just begging to get beat. So how do you do it? You have a great kid in high school and he's averaging 25. How's he scoring? Well, he's coming off pick and roll. He's scoring transition. He's scoring here. Well, every time he, every single time pick and roll, we got to trap him. Why? Because he's been killing the whole state in this same way all year. Well, if you're going to play him the same way, he's going to kill you the same way. You're either going to just lay down and take it or change it up, make them see something different. Try to take it away. I mean, there's ways to take away great players. Now, people will say you can't stop them. You can only hope to contain them, stuff like that. Well, maybe you can if you really learn how to trap a kid and pick and roll and you do it every single time and you get your team prepared to do it and say, we're going to take this part of his game away. Your team's going to be like, hell yeah, that's a good plan. Coach, let's go. Let's go. Let's trap him good. Then, then in practice, you're fired up. You're motivated. You put that guy's jersey number on and you and, uh, on the scout team and you're like, go. Like, this guy gets a screen. We're going to trap. He's never coming off pick and roll clean. And, and so let's see if we win that game. You know, like get them motivated with, with your game plan. Get them motivated with why you're going to beat this team. Why you can beat this team that's like got a way better record than you. Because we have a game plan I think is going to work. And you show them. This is how it's going to work. This guy scored 16 points a night off pick and roll. He's going to get trapped every time. And he better find the open man because we're keeping two on the ball till he gets rid of it. Try to motivate your guys through your game plan, but compete more at the end of the year. I think it really keeps competition up and like keep them going hard. Keep them like battling during those competition. It's not to me when players start getting pissed off in practice. It's a great thing late in the year when when you're when you have a good team and your team's like starters against the subs and they're just battling, almost fighting, that's not a bad thing. That's a damn good thing. As long as you bring them in at the end, get them together, it's like, man, you guys are ready because you you know how to compete. You're fighting each other. Now you got to fight these guys way harder because they're gonna now these guys are going to have your back. We fought each other all week. Now let's go get those guys. 
I mean, I, I feel motivated now. I'm sitting in a chair podcasting, yeah. but definitely a, a great a, a kind of just idea of maybe how, how to do that effectively. And I'm curious, obviously, you've coached at so many levels. You've seen so many guys do that the right way or and seen so many guys that are motivated, so many guys that aren't, and maybe help them through that. Uh, one guy in particular, maybe all our listeners know, um, and we've, I mentioned him on the show all the time, obviously, is Andre Ingram because he's kind of the definition of hard work, right? When you think of a guy um, with his story of uh, being so maybe quote unquote old for the G League um, and still finally getting his opportunity in the NBA, I um, mean, being motivated to kind of to sit through, to sit through that and go through that experience. I'm curious maybe what it was like, maybe because he he was tested to see if he was motivated enough and he obviously passed. So what did it look like for a guy like that in, in, in doing that? Right. Well, I mean, you know, there's not a lot of people like Andre born for that situation. You know, when I think of Andre and like every one of us that know him, like he's a way better person than he is a shooter. He's just the guy that never gets down. The first year that I was at South Bay, it was the defenders. It wasn't called South Bay, but we had like a, we had a situation where we had a really good team and Andre's role at the beginning of the season was not high minutes. In fact, we had trouble getting Andre a bunch of minutes. This is the best shooter in G league history. So we're saying to ourselves, are we doing this right? You know, we got to get Andre on the court more. It was like, maybe small minutes, six to 10 minutes a game. And we're like, and we were kind of flowing a little bit, but we didn't really have our rotation right. And we were agonizing over it. And the management was agonizing over it. And the fans were agonizing over it. But there was one person that wasn't agonizing over it. (laughs) It was Andre. He didn't, he was just ready. He would give me five minutes, but there's no, there was no fake in that. There was no walk away from you with some vibe in that. There was no, it was real. Like he was accepting his role. It was like, that's the biggest cliche in history of sports, accept your role. But he's accepting his role, like actually accepting it. It's like, that's ridiculous. Like ultimately he ended up starting, was the best shooter in that that season, shot over 50% from three in the G League, the NBA line. Like that's, you can't do that. He just had faith in, in himself, just knowing that, the way things happen in the G League, that even if he is stuck in this low minute role, he's going to beat everybody that is even above him in his spot. There's no doubt in his mind. He doesn't blame. There's just a natural not blame in him. There's a natural something that none of us have unless we really work at it. And I'm sure he worked to get to that point. But that's better. Like, I'm not sitting here telling you how good of a shooter is. I'm sitting here telling you how this guy's mental was just like a laser beam. You can't get him off it. If you put a if you put a, a, a camera in Andre's face when he shoots, he shoot a hundred shots. You wouldn't know if he made or missed any of them. You wouldn't know. His expression doesn't change. You go out there, get shots with the guys, and they go and they shoot and they make it miss three in a row punch the ball, scream, cuss. If you're an opponent, if you're Andre and you're seeing that, like he's, you know, he's like, got it. I got an edge over this guy. Your body language matters. Like this guy missed a free throw. You couldn't tell unless you saw the basket. His attitude has nothing ever changed with him. He got that small moment in the NBA. Man, I wish he would have continued because Andre would have been better the better players on the court he's on with uh, because he's the ultimate floor spreader, the ultimate, like you can't load the floor away from him. You have to put someone right there. And so if he was in the NBA, he would have been better than in the G League. Like if anyone was going to shoot 55% in the NBA, it would have been him because, you know, he's not an off the dribble shooter. He's not a bad shot shooter. He shoots only good shots and he shoots them and he makes them. I always wish that after that moment, that the beautiful moment, that the next season someone would have given him a chance. But still, it doesn't matter because this day today as we sit here, he's still that laser. He's still that same laser beam of a person. And you could never get a negative thing out of him, ever. I love that. And th- I mean, thank you for just kind of going into detail about that because we always hear about Andre and you always hear just the, 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 the generics where you see it works hard, all that stuff. And that description of his laser beam focus really paints the picture of who he is and, and kind of why it happened. I mean, everyone kind of thinks he worked hard. Why no, it's because of it's because of his mentality, it's because of so many other things, maybe than just the, the two words of hard work that everyone maybe kind of throws around. That, that really did a, a great job painting that picture. 
So, I mean, definitely, I mean, it's incredible to think about that. I mean, I mean, Coach Walsh, thank you so much for coming out and sharing all the all, the, all these stories. I mean, I, this kind of this podcast, I might have to break it up into two parts. I haven't decided yet, but with all the international stuff and of course, all the assistant coaching stuff and all, all everything really was was just perfect. And it's something that I can relate to so much kind of being in that role now and, and maybe seeing a lot of parallels. So, I mean, thank you so much for coming out and putting on a, a clinic. I mean, kind of understanding all these different things, whether it's the international game, assistant coaching, all that good stuff. Thank you so much. Thanks, man. This was fun. I had a good time and I'd love to do it whenever you want. And uh, I'm glad that the world, that the country's opened up and hopefully we have a, our next basketball season. We have fans and we're rolling back and our lives back together for basketball. Thanks for listening to Gen Z Hoops. Make sure to follow, like, and subscribe on Instagram, LinkedIn, and all major social media platforms at Gen Z Hoops. You can tune in and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and every other podcast platform on the planet. Get ready for the next episode.